Hello and welcome to another episode of the show on paulhober.com on YouTube. Uh, I'm going to give you a basic introduction to the different types of shockwave here because we've had some really good discussions on, on this uh, section and I wanted to talk about the differences between radial and focused. So let's talk about radial first of all. This has a bullet that shoots up and down the inside of this nozzle here and makes an impact onto the end piece here. Now the end piece you can take off and we have different types of metal in the end pieces here called applicators and as you can see from there that's a gold one which is a deeper impact so you get greater depth and that one is a silver one which is if you like the standard setting. Now when that bullet comes up and down and actually impacts upon this uh, metal applicator. When that makes contact with the skin, the greatest pressure is with the skin, and then we end up with the fanning out, if you like, of the shock waves into the skin. But like a light bulb, the greatest pressure is at the contact um, or, or, or at the source, and then it gets less and less as it fans out. So. As I apply it onto my skin, I can feel the greatest pressure on that skin contact and then it gets less and less as it goes into the skin and the depths of radial shock wave are, are superficial compared to focus shock wave. Now focus shock wave is with a standoff, we'll just take the standoff away. So the focus of the, of the shock wave here is always about the same distance away from the applicator. So the reason that we put a different standoff here is simply to move the machine further away from the skin contact, but in effect this is like a laser pointer, so very, very specific treatment point. And if I tilt the head, then the treatment area changes dramatically. So rather than trying to explain that in too much more detail, um, what we've got is this nice glass block here. So if I were to be using this standoff, then you can see where the treatment will be. If I were to use a smaller standoff, then the treatment would be in this range. And without a standoff, the treatment depth, as you see, is much greater. So we've got a much, much more pinpoint opportunity for the treatment area, so if you were trying to treat, let's say, a high hamstring origin, um, with this machine you'd be able to be very, very specific about where that treatment went, but you'd have to be relying on patient feedback all the time to make sure that you were angling this in the correct position and you'd need to use their feedback to help you find that. With the radial, you would definitely be looking for that same high hamstring issue um, at the gold head because you need to get the great depth you'd need to really push this into the tissue to take up all the slack you could so that you've got a chance of reaching that high hamstring now make no mistake i've treated high hamstrings very successfully with the radial i probably need more sessions and i probably need a really really high energy which is quite painful and can actually mark the skin um, unless you keep the gel in the way this is much more um, able to do that treatment, it's not working at its maximum and it's, it's uh, uh, say a lot less pain for the patient um, but you do have to make sure you're angling it correctly. Now, let's talk about the two different technologies. So for superficial tendons, I think this is brilliant um, unless it gets too superficial. So if we're talking about golfer's elbow, this is just, I think, too painful. You've got to really bring the pressure's down, so this is measured in bar pressure. You've really got to bring that down to a very, very low level. And I would argue that you can't work directly on the bone. You have to work just about half an inch away from the tissues. Again, remember it's fanning out. You, you can't really miss with that. Whereas with the focused, you can go directly onto that um, common origin uh, and the patient will be able to accept it. So. Let's talk about patient acceptance and compliance. Um, with, with both machines, I don't believe that uh, it should be no pain, no gain, to a point. Although the patient must be feeling a sensation 
otherwise I'm not sure this is working. So um, what you're trying to do is stimulate cells and in order to stimulate the cells you're working quite significantly on the macrophage cell um, as, as well as, as others but the macrophage if you like can be split into two parts. One part, um, just go with me on this, feels sensation, the other part doesn't uh, and it's been shown in some early studies that if you actually uh, numb off that part of the cell which feels sensation then the shockwave doesn't seem to work. So yes we have mechanotransduction taking place but unless there is a sensation from the tissues, um, say for example if you gave a local anaesthetic, shockwave's efficacy goes down dramatically. So with that in mind we need the patient to feel it but what we mustn't have is a situation where the patient is in agony, releasing stress hormone and affecting the, um, the, the way in which the treatment's going to be uh, effective in that sense. So it's really very important that you ensure the patient can feel it. So I like to work to a kind of uh, five out of 10 on the, on the pain scale. There, there are people who push for higher, higher um, treatment bar pressures and, and uh, energy flux density. So the more pressure, the greater chance you've got of getting the depth in the tissues. Um, and I can't say that they're wrong, and I can't say that I'm right. It's just um, from all the research that I've seen and from the experience I've had in clinic, when you bring those two together, the results don't seem to differ dramatically when the patient finds this uh, more acceptable from a, from a pain level. Um, they tend to come back, which is quite good, um, and I, I don't see a change in efficacy. <clears throat> However, if you're going to lose, use really, really low pressures, then there's potential that you might need to think about doing um, more sessions or more shocks. Um, the general rule of thumb that I've seen is that you would do 2,500 shocks in each session and anything from three to six sessions. So 500 shocks at the beginning at a very, very low um, energy flux density, so either bar pressure here or, or millijoules per square millimeter on the focus and you would warm up the tissues in effect, giving it a chance to numb. And then the therapeutic dose is a 2,000 shocks, where you try and either get the, the, the energy flux density, or as it's mentioned in bar pressure on the radial, you try and get that kind of as high as you can, but within a framework of a five out of 10 on the pain scale. So most people will have a radial device, and I think this is how most people start off. I don't know whether that's because of the versatility of this machine or whether it's because it's uh, less expensive, but once you've tried a focus machine, it's quite difficult to imagine life without one, but again, it, it can be um, slightly over double the cost of the machine. Most of the early research, in fact not all of it, this, this type of, of data has been around for 40 years, the radial machine 20 years. So. Uh, radial is catching up in, in what it can do and I find this machine uh, very very versatile in the fact you can change the end pieces and even we've got applicators now which can work um, say for example on fascia so to save your cranky thumbs like mine um, you can change the depth and it's really really safe there's only if you look at the International Society of Medical Shockwave Treatments their uh, advice um, on contraindications is that there are really only two. One is you mustn't use it over the stomach of a pregnant lady, and the second is you mustn't use it over a primary tumour. With the list of contraindications that you will see on a lot of the manufacturers' websites, you've got things like anticoagulant medication, you've got don't use it over the lung tissue, don't use it within six weeks of having a cortisone injection, and, and there's a big long list um, well not actually that long, it's about five or six items on there. Um, and I would always say it's worth paying attention to that broader list, even when you're using the radial shockwave, but pay really close attention when you're using the focus shockwave, because as yet, this hasn't been, um, if you like, proven to step away from those contraindications. Um, so it's really important, even though the ISMST is saying there's only two contraindications for radial. If you had a patient coming into you who had 
uh, a significant um, issue with blood clotting, um, who, who had had a cortisone injection in the last six weeks. These are things that you need to pay attention to. So let's take cortisone injection as an example. Um, if someone's had two or three cortisone injections, I'm immediately thinking that this tendon is really, really unhappy for whatever the reason. Um, and so it probably has a higher chance of rupture, not, I believe, because of the number of injections, but because that person has been for three injections, the likelihood is that it's not responding very well. The tendon is, is, is for want of a better word, very, very unhappy. And we should proceed with caution with either of these machines because if that person then goes off and has a spontaneous rupture, I don't believe it would have anything to do with the fact we applied shockwave, it's just that shockwave takes three months to really come to fruition in, in terms of its treatment. Yes, we get some early pain development and lots of our patients will show improvements above and beyond that three months, but is that tendon going to last the three months while the treatment works or was it going to snap anyway? So. Um, and there's lots of instances where you can, you know, appreciate this in, in life, um, such as you put 40,000 people on the road to run a marathon on one day, the likelihood is that someone was possibly going to drop dead that day. Um, they may do on the run. Everyone blames the running event. Everyone blames the fact they were running. Um, sometimes things are just going to happen and it's irrespective uh, and actually it's a uh, an unhappy coincidence that it happened at that time. Because as yet, I've never heard of any rupture associated to shockwave therapy in any tendon or any muscle or any ligament. But people do rupture their tendons, ligaments and muscles. So we need to be aware of the patient where we think they're at a higher risk and think about whether clinical reasoning wise, whether this is the right, right mode for us. Um, let's take anticoagulant drugs. Um, this person is much more likely to bruise um, and, and bleed, and so we need to think very, very carefully about is this the right treatment option to be putting on that person because we do not want to create any complications. The radial device has been shown by the International Society of Medical Shockwave Treatments that that is not a risk to that group. So these list of contraindications, if you like, came about because these machines are based on the much, much bigger, much more powerful lithotriptors, the, the real um, medical line that, that you see, and they are producing huge, great big energy flux densities because they need to break up um, you know, deposits of um, kidney stone and things like this. These machines are greatly reduced in the amount of, of power that they can produce, and the contraindication list that was borrowed from the big lithotriptors over time, over the last 40 years, we realized we can really strip that down. Um, and these machines are really very, very safe indeed. But you need to pick your patient, you need to make sure you've got the right diagnosis, and with the right diagnosis and the right application, these can be fantastic. And over the course of future videos, what I will be doing is to bring to you um, a, a series of different shorter videos that show you how to treat the various different indications. And we're going to start off with plantar fasciopathy, go on to Achilles tendinopathy, medial tibial stress syndrome or shin splints, patella tendinopathy, high hamstring tendinopathy. We'll then also do medial and lateral epicondylitis and calcific tendonitis to the shoulder. And once we've covered off those, we can start getting people involved in our advanced webinars where we bring people together, I mean in this room, but virtually bring them together and we talk uh, and teach through a, a whole list of advanced applications of this technology. So around the world, we can have great quality teaching uh, and you can tune in either at the time and ask questions or you can come into it at a later time and download the recording. Um, we ask for people to give an expression of interest to be part of one of those webinars and once we get a critical mass then we record one and so it moves on. So I look forward to seeing you on one of those webinars. I really really hope that you're going to dip in and watch some of our expert interviews 
where we get the very, very best in class as far as shockwave is concerned and we do a 30 to 40 minute interview with them on their specialism and in those moments is where you really get some of the, the most insightful pieces of information and learning and don't forget this can all be registered for your own CPD so this is absolutely golden nugget time in terms of helping you develop your shockwave practice and your shockwave uh, clinical application but it's also going to go a long way towards you fulfilling your CPD criteria. So I look forward to seeing you again at one of these little video conferences. Thank you very much.